everything you do flows from it. And another scripture says that um, that your life, the way you live your life comes from the way your heart is at. And tonight, the title of, of the Women's Midweek tonight is The Heart of the Matter. And I really love, thank you, Esther and Rachel, for that beautiful <laughs> display <laughs> of what's behind it is your heart. Every single thing you do flows from what is in your heart. So you're naturally going to do what's in your heart. The challenge with that is that the heart is deceitful above all things, like the scriptures say. And the Bible also says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. There is a lot of incredible scriptures about the heart. But it's so important that we check our hearts because everything we do flows from it. So I really want to encourage everybody. This midweek is so important. And I've, I've really thought through this and prayed through this time. Uh, I asked Olga. Thank you, Olga, for recording it. Hello, Vancouver sisters. We have the Vancouver sisters with us on Zoom. Um, and anybody that couldn't make it, I've asked Olga to record this because these are... These charges are going, if you really hear them and put them into practice, they will take you to the next level spiritually. They will, it will help you be more like Christ. And uh, my charge is about prayer and it's going to be very simple. Um, And God put this on my heart because I really believe that um, like the scripture says, everything we do flows from our heart, but When someone lives a life of gratitude and really understanding the convictions of the scripture, they just want to be a disciple. Like you just want to be a disciple when you really understand heart convictions. It just flows from you. That's just what you want to do because you know the promises of God. You believe the promises of God. You just want to obey God because you trust God and you believe it and you have faith in it. So my charge is about prayer. And um, let's look in Luke 11. It's, we're going to go real basic, but I, I don't want, um, even though you've probably heard this many times throughout your life, I really want to break it down because this prayer has saved my life. And it's the way Jesus taught his disciples to pray. It is the way we should all be praying every single day. It's, it's meant to be a daily prayer. We see that because they ask for daily bread. You wouldn't ask for daily bread if it was a weekly prayer. You'd ask for weekly bread, right? So it's meant to be prayed every day. In um, Luke 11, verse 1, it says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So you have to stop and wonder, why were the disciples so intrigued by the way Jesus prayed? Well, we kind of get a glimpse into that in Matthew 26, when Jesus took all of his emotions to prayer. And he was able to go from a reluctant heart to do God's will and die on the cross at the end of the day, to a heart that was totally resolved. My sisters, you do not have to give into your emotions you do not have to live by your emotions not only do you not have to but you shouldn't the bible says you deny yourself the disciples deny ourselves that's what we do that's that's literally a mark of discipleship is you deny yourself but how do you do that through prayer prayer changes you prayer can change your emotions in um luke 11 verse 2 it says He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. So hallowed be your name. To hallow God's name means to worship God, to praise God, to consider all the amazing things about who God is, his attributes, his power. When you're that, that should be the first part of your prayer. This is an outline of prayer. You don't like rotely say it every day. That would be I mean, if if you were trying to get to know someone, you wouldn't say the same five sentences every time you saw them, right? No, this is an outline. These are all the elements we should have in our daily prayer. So the first one is praising God, giving God glory, worshiping God. The next one is your kingdom come. This is where you pray for people. 
you pray for those in the kingdom, those outside of the kingdom, pray for others, pray for people. The third, give us each day our daily bread. This is where you pray for your physical needs. You might have physical needs or spiritual needs. Maybe you're, I know a lot of people here work with kids, like, God, please help me be patient today. Or, you know, I have to wake up early. Please give me the energy to go through this day or whatever it might be. I have a long night. Please, you know, help me through this. Give me the endurance. So it could be spiritual needs or physical needs. Then it says, um, forgive us our sins. Who sinned today? <laughs> I hope everyone has their hand up. If not, we can do another Bible study. <laughs> because we are human. Like when you compare yourself to Jesus, you're just not him. Okay? So that can keep us at a place of humility 24-7. Because we sin every day. And the, the center point of being a, a woman of God, the center point of being a disciple is relationships, your relationship with God and your relationship with others. So you pray, God, forgive me of my sin. Why? Because sin hardens your heart and sin separates you from God. So every day you want to really be thoughtful about your sin and pray for forgiveness. And then it says, we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Why? Because you probably got cut off on the way here and it hurt your feelings. Or maybe you shared your faith with someone who rejected you and it hurt your feelings. You know, it says, for, we also forgive everyone who sins against us. We're around people all the time. So we need to have a heart of forgiveness toward others every single day. And then it says, and lead us not into temptation. So if you pray this prayer every day, I absolutely believe that God will take you, to the, thank you, take you to the next level. And not only that, but it is a command of God for us to be women who lay our requests before him and pray every day. So that is my simple lesson on prayer. I give you Ingrid. Well, hi, guys. My lesson today is the word of God. Um, you know how when we do the cross on Sundays, people answer the question, what does the cross mean to you? Today, I want to answer, what does the word mean to me? Whoa, and to me, the word of God is an invitation. So I want to share Isaiah 55, 8. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Isaiah 55, verse 8. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And where do we find God's thoughts? In the Bible. Where do we find his ways? Therefore, the word of God is an invitation to know God's thoughts and his ways. And I just thought, that is so amazing. One time, I was, I don't, I was at a coffee shop, and I found a journal. I looked around. It was outside the coffee shop, and it wasn't anyone's. So I grabbed it, and... You know, we're a little, we're a little curious. I opened it, and the first page, page was an agenda, and it had everything that that person had to do. And I got a little invested. I'm like, okay, they got to pick up the kids, they got to do their homework, they got to do all this stuff. And I turned the next page, and we got a journal entry. So I started reading it. I was like, oh, okay, that's some good stuff. And then I turned the next page, and there's more tea. And I'm like, so invested. I don't even know this person. I just know they're a mom and they have kids and they got problems, problems. And I keep reading, right? And then I turn the next page and it's blank. And I'm like, oh no, we're wow. done. I was so invested in this story. I guess she didn't finish the journal. But I thought if that was that person's inner thoughts, man, I just got to know a stranger. Like, I don't even know who this person is, but I know them. And I know what they're going through. Yeah. And so I was like, what's the disciple thing to do? Okay, I'll pray for them. I was like, God, you know them. You know, I pray for them. Um, but I was thinking the Bible is like God's journal. And we get to discover it. And like the more you read it, the more you get invested in it. You're like, oh, wow. Look at the way God thinks. Look at his ways. And you just like, you want to read it more. And I want to encourage you guys to see God's word that way. As a journal. As God's personal journal. His inner ways. And to devour it. Devour it the way we devour Sonia's food. I mean, yeah. so good. Nobody cooks like Sonia. Um, I want to share a scripture in Jeremiah 15 that talks about food since we're on the topic of food. Come on. Oh, the mic hair. Yeah, my hair is very thick. I'm sorry. Um, Jeremiah 15, 16. Is that good? Oh. 
this? Okay, Jeremiah 15, 16, it says, When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Do you guys know the number one way to lose weight? This is not a weight class, by the way, or anything like that. Anyone know? Anyone? It is not working out. It is eating less. It's a calorie deficit. And some of y'all looking like you're on a spiritual calorie deficit. Some of us look so skinny. And that's just because you're not eating. You are not devouring God's word. I love this scripture in Jeremiah because he says, I devour your word. It's just so delicious. It's so good. You guys need to eat more, okay? We need in-depth Bible studies, not like Google uh, scriptures about hope. That's elementary. We don't do that anymore. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. But I'm just saying, like, we have to devour God's word. You know, I've, I've gone to the place in my discipleship where some of my best quiet times are no commentaries no google no phone just me and the word we all have the holy spirit and the holy spirit wants to tell you something through the word of god and so i just want to encourage you guys to have in-depth bible studies because like i said it's an invitation to know god and every morning god prepares a meal for you and he's like is she gonna eat it up he's like so excited like watching you you know when someone cooks for you and they're like oh does she like it that's God. He wants you to like what he's made for you. So I want to leave you guys with a challenge here to read Psalm 119 and figure out what the word means to you. Amen. All right. I got 300 seconds and I'm going to use every one of them. All right. Um, so we talked about the word of God, which is the foundation that we live on, right? We talked about prayer, which if the foundation is where we build, then the prayer is what we, the walls are held up by, right? And Jesus is our chief cornerstone. We all know that, right? Well, prayer, what I'm going to talk about is singing. All right? Are you ready? Here we go. No, no, I'm not. I'm going to spare you. But if, if the word of God is a foundation and prayer what holds it together, and Jesus is our chief cornerstone, singing is what we decorate our spiritual life with. All right, so Colossians 3.16, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. Why do we sing, guys? Why do we sing? Um, in, uh, I think it's Numbers 21, was the first song that uh, Moses started to sing all of the Israelites when they were or lost in the desert, just going around in circles, they praise God for prov providing for them. But why do we string, sing? We sing because it strengthens our hearts in the truths of God's word. Uh, Paul tells us in this scripture that it richly, that God, Christ dwells in us richly, and he tells us how to do that by singing psalms, by hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing stands along with preaching as one of the greatest ways to have God's word deeply rooted in your hearts. Singing is so, so important, you guys. Um, and when we sing, there is a way to do that. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I got my own songbook. Got my name on there. You know me, artsy, a little bit. Um, uh, I have a songbook. I also have the songs on digital. I want every one of you to either have one of these or this by Sunday okay so talk to me why why do we need this because I think there's something that we need to learn about singing it says how do we sing is that so we know why we need to sing we need to know how to sing and there's practical ways to do that one songbook why do we need songbook we need to learn the words we need to learn the songs they are prayers from the bible that have been made into songs why do songs hit us in our emotional, right in the middle, right? Why does it hit us right here in the heart? Because it just, it connects with us. And God connects with us through, through song. And um, practical ways to do that, let's first read Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. I'm going to read the, um, the ESV version. It says, and do not be drunk on wine, for that is debaucherous, but be Filled with the spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord. Have you ever thought about making melody to the Lord? 
Well, the practical things is, why do I have my own songbook? It's because I always sing songs in my quiet times. That's how I learn the songs. That's why I know the words. We have a, a very great team that puts the words up in front of us. But it's funny, Courtney asked me to do this on Sunday night, me singing. I was talking about singing. Okay, let's do it. Um, but I told Dee Dee, Dee Dee can attest to this. I told Dee Dee, I go, man, I've been in children's ministry a long time. This is great to be in here and the, on the side. And it's so great because I can look and sing and, to everybody. Then Courtney asked me later on, and she said, it's because you're so great at doing that. And you know what? Well, I was watching you guys today. I was watching you sing. You guys were gladly looking at the sisters and you were gladly looking at Keisha because she's fun to watch when she's singing, right? But it was a repeat song, ladies. It was a repeat song. You don't have to look at them. You don't have to look at words. You repeat what they say. Look at one another. That's what the Bible tells us. Sing to one another. That's what is Ephesians tells us. We need to do that. You need to know that God desires that for one another. That is how our hearts get encouraged, right? Also, um, we talked about having songbooks. I talked about I sing in my quiet times, and it's so powerful. Me and Aaron used to do that. I loved Aaron. And uh, physically looking around, which is so important, clap, snap, and enjoy, guys. That's what you need to do, all right? So please, please take this to heart. Get a songbook. Learn the words. That's why I don't look at the screen because I know the words. I want you guys to know the words. So let's go. Let's give our hearts. Let's give our snaps and let's give our smiles. Good evening, guys. Are we good? Are we good here? Okay. Awesome. Okay. So my charge for the evening is talking about seeking first the kingdom, but my title is the heart of the kingdom. In reflection to the heart of the matter, I was thinking, you know, seek first the kingdom, but what is the heart of the kingdom? What is the heartbeat of the kingdom? We're going to jump right in um, to Matthew chapter six, starting in verse 25, a passage you guys are very familiar with, but it says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. We're going to skip down just for the sake of time. You guys are familiar. It talks about we can't even add a single hour to our life by worrying. So why do we do it? I don't know. But what, what's the solution? We all know it in verse 33. What is the solution? Exactly. Okay, so we see the passage extensively talks about worry. We know biblically that the solution is the word, but I love that it has the word, but like you can do all these things, but you need to seek first the kingdom. So what does that look like? Well, we fast forward in the Bible to Acts chapter two in verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so I I when I was reflecting on what to share tonight, I read those two passages and I was like, I feel like we could end here because the two passages have a very different context to them. We know that Matthew 6, we worry why? Because we're focused on self. Yes, it can, it, come, it can come from a place of fear, uncertainty, but at the end of the day, we worry because we're focused on self. There's an element of that that we don't trust God. Therefore, we get inward focused. And what do we start worrying about? Things like what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat. You know, these things that seem so minuscule, and I know that we can have legitimate things that we can worry about, but when we're not seeking first the kingdom, you have to believe that the byproduct of that is an element of worldliness. Yeah. And I dare say that there's been an element of worldliness that's crept into the church that we have to be very careful about. I think it's important that as you guys are building relationships with other people and talking, hanging out as friends, that you're mindful of what are the things that are coming out of your mouth? What are you sharing? 
is it is it are you communicating a message that really communicates no i'm seeking first the kingdom at any cost do i have a peace right we can talk we can be open about things that are that are on our hearts but when we get inward just know biblically that the result is an element of worldliness but the encouraging part is that we see a perfect example of the first century church right the kingdom of god in the first century it, none of it was about self. You see, they, they um, sacrificed their time, their money. Um, they gave to anyone who had need. They sold property. Every day they continued to meet together. It was a communal, um, it was a communal picture that we see. And I just love that it says that the byproduct of that is what? The end. The Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. And so, you know, I think it's it's really, really important that we can be mindful of this. I know when we talk about, you know, when we're studying the Bible with people, we can talk about what it means to seek first the kingdom. And it's like, oh, come to all the meetings of the body. And yes, that's a percent of it. But there's so much more to it. Some quick practicals, because um, we could do a whole sermon about this. But some quick practicals to know that you're really giving your whole heart and what it looks like to seek first the kingdom is yes attending the meetings of the body, but it's so much deeper to, deeper than that. It's really showing up ready to give, praying beforehand. Who can I impact? Who can I encourage? Who do I know is having a, going through a hard time? What can I do to really lift their spirits? Um, plan fun hang times and pull new people in. Um, rest with disciples, not away from disciples. Um, and ultimately, refuse to have surfacey relationships in our relationships with one another. Dig deep. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, but really, really dig deep to God be all of the glory. So my charge tonight is confession and discipling. Yes, I know you're really excited about this one, but uh, this is going to save your life spiritually. Um, there's an evangelist who once said that um, there are three ways to healing. Uh, one is by sweating it out because you're telling your body, you know what, I'm not going to let this trauma stop me. Um, another way is by your tears, because you're letting out that emotional pain. And then the third one is by your words, because through your words, you get to be seen, you get to let it all out, you get to be heard. And that's what confession is. Confession is your time to walk in the light. It's your time to receive protection from God, because you're being open about your temptations. Uh, it's also a time to get stronger. You know, as you get open, you receive the assistance, the scriptures, and the discipling that you need with the things that you're dealing with. So my first little point here is God is light. Are you there where God is? God is light. So light and darkness cannot coexist. So there are several scriptures in the Bible that talk about how God is light and his glory is shown through light. You cannot see God's glory unless he's shining his light upon you on, or on whomever or on whatever. And it's a great Bible study to do because sometimes we need to get back to remembering that we cannot actually be his disciples and live in the darkness. So um, one scripture I want to reference is Revelation 21, 22 to 27, just really quickly. It just references heaven, and it talks about how when we're there, we're going we're gonna to be walking by its light. And in the definition of walking, it actually means to the point of being occupied with. So if we're asking ourselves, what are we occupying ourselves with? It should be light. But if you're not getting open about sin or being transparent, you're occupied, you're occupied with darkness. But that's not the goal, right? We want to be occupied with light and with God. We want to be with Jesus. Four foundational scriptures are 1 John 1, 5 to 10. It's a great one. I love it because it talks about what true fellowship is. It says, this is a message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. So it's saying we cannot claim to be disciples if we're actually not being transparent about our sins and our struggles. We cannot say we have a relationship with God. Otherwise, if we do that, we are making ourselves to be liars because we're not living out the truth that God calls us to live out, which is to walk in the light. 
It also says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus. So you know those fellowship breaks at church? Okay, that's a time to be open with wisdom because time is limited. But fellowship is not real fellowship if you're not being open about your sin. Have you ever had a best friend or a great discipling relationship or a sister you felt really close to? More than likely, that connection was there because either both of you or one of you were very open about your sin. And fellowship breeds connection. Being open about your sin, walking in the light breeds connection. And that's why you feel close to one another. So during the fellowship break, if we're not being open and it's really shallow, then we're not actually fellowshipping, just biblically speaking. The promise, too, is that when we're open, God purifies us from all sin. And that's what you have to cling on to. Confession can be so hard if we get stuck in our heads. But that's where we need to keep our eyes on the promise and that God, Jesus, will purify us. The second thing is discipling, right? Discipling, this is the second point, is basically confession's partner. Yes. You know, being a disciple is like being on a one-way lane to heaven. You're just, you're just focused on going forward. But sometimes you have things around you can't see. And one of the main reasons a discipler is so beneficial is because they're there to point out your blind spots spiritually. And we may not like it, but that's where you have to hold on to the promises, right? So with that being said, be open. Talk about everything, your sin, your, your struggles, your temptations. That's part of being like confessing. In your discipling relationship, always see to it that you guys are in connection weekly. Talk about your time or the plan for that week. And at minimum, it should not really be the case. At minimum, if you guys can't meet in person, make a phone call and still have a D time. That's at minimum, right? Um, but in the end of it all, embrace challenge. If you feel like your discipling dynamic is not where it should be, then embrace love. And the good news is you can always work on it. Okay, so that's my charge. Okay, I bring you a life of purpose, evangelism. Let's preach, let's preach. Okay, <laughs> so I, when I'm thinking about evangelism, I have a image in my in front of me. It's like somebody is calling me, telling me that my kids are missing somebody you love deeply that is missing so in that moment i can guarantee that i would drop everything drop my nets immediately and then running out the door and go find them nothing else matter at that time because i love them i care about them deeply and i know that they are lost so christ command us to save the lost and if Christ is in my heart, then I will care about what Jesus cares about the most. In Matthew 9.36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. This is how Jesus viewed the lost, with deep compassion and urgency. But I need to confess, I need to confess, this is not always the heart I have. I I know this is Carmen's heart because she is sharing her faith anytime, anywhere, even in the middle of our conversation. Say, you wait, I need to save that sauce. Come on, <laughs> I know this is always hard because she's literally our campus sharing machine. She's crazy, this girl. <laughs> so this command so in Matthew 28 18 to 20 everyone should memorize this verse Jesus gives us the great commission all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I think this command to make disciples of all nations is not optional. It is a direct command from God 
It's his last word. Belief alone doesn't save us. Yes, we have been baptized, but it's not once saved, always saved. It is our continuous perseverance in doing God's work and obeying his command that keep us on the path of salvation. Faith without deeds are dead. We are fired up soldiers in his army. I cannot think of anything more glorious by giving our all in the battle of saving souls. Imagine, imagine this, everyone, close your eyes and think about one day you're in the heaven and the little girl come to you, tap you on the shoulder, say, hey, hey, I just want to let you know that I'm here because you are never afraid to tell me about Jesus. And how amazing would that be? And that's our true purpose. That will never fade away. That will never die. That will never change. So we need to persevere in our prayer, in reading the word of God, in singing, in remind ourselves and each other the heart of the kingdom. Confess, be open, and then really live in our true purpose every single day to keep us energized and rejoicing. To God be all the glory. All right. I will wrap it up really quickly. Um, I chose these sisters methodically because they are all great examples in these areas. Um, Ingrid has been, I think about the scripture in Psalm 11992, it says, if your word had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. And Ingrid has been such a great example through different challenges. I've had the opportunity to be in her life for the last eight years. And I've seen her go through so many different things and really go to God's word to help her grow through her challenges. And she's such an incredible example of a woman who has deep conviction on the word of God. And she's, you know, there's a couple of sisters that will be like, look at this nugget I read in my quiet time. She's one of those sisters or I'll send my nuggets to her. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at this. It's it's probably like almost every other day. <laughs> it's pretty often. Um, but she just loves the word of God. And Deanne is such a great example in singing to God. Um, Deanne has just amazing convictions. Some of you might not know this, but Deanne fell away from God for how many years? Nine years. And um, she was our first restoration of the Seattle church. And um, so when she comes up here, she comes up here with conviction because she knows what it is to walk with God and she knows what it is to walk without God. And she knows what leads you to a place of not walking with God. Um, and she's such a great example of smiling. And, yeah. and these things are important because when you're singing, it's a direct reflection of where your faith is at in your relationship with God because you're worshiping God. And you're singing with your sisters and brothers. And, um, you know, she's a great example of singing to God and really even thinking through the words that, that she's singing. And um, as she shared, she re or she sings in her quiet times. That is an example for all of us to follow. Thank you so much, Deanne. If you want deeper convictions on this, read. I just sent out the PDF of the songbook to everybody on the different chats. Read the intro. It literally talks about the importance of singing to God. Uh, Jenny is such a great example of having unwavering faith when it comes to seeking first the kingdom. Has anybody ever wondered if Jenny was going to show up to something? Never. What an example. She has incredible convictions about this. She lives far away. She has kids in different sports and different health challenges. She wakes up at the four o'clock hour and she does. And she's always committed to God. She comes very early on Sunday. She's there all day. Um, she just has a great example um, for us to imitate. And, um, you know, it's something that I want to share about fellowship. It's so important to come early so you can really get fellowship and have those deep conversations like I think Natalie was sharing. Um, and even... Set your mind to be giving when you walk into church. You know, don't just go sit down. Walk around. Don't sit down until after the, wel or the welcome starts. When, when there's a fellowship break, stand up. Think about who can I talk to? Who can I get closer to? Who can I? Uh, it, you grow the more relationships that you have with like-minded people. 
Um, Nat is such a great example in discipling. I love being having a discipleship partnership with Nat. Uh, you know, we were we were roommates in college, and uh, we were. I'll show you pictures. <laughs> it's crazy, uh, but Nat is a woman who's very honest. Like you, she, you're. She's a woman who walks in the light. She's a woman who, it good, bad, or ugly, she wants it to be seen so that she can be more like Christ. And you're such a great example of discipling. Do you sisters believe from the scriptures that discipling is a command of God? Does anyone have a scripture that supports that conviction? Yes, India. Yes, that's an easy one right there. But there's so many other. When you read through the scriptures, there's so many scriptures that support the conviction that discipling is a command of God. And we really need to commit to having weekly discipling times, but also to just be in each other's lives. The love of the kingdom is the center of the kingdom. The Bible says that all of the law and the prophets hang on the two commands to love God and love people. So love is the center of everything that we do. And in closing, Yvonne, I thought, Yvonne, you shared that you're, you're not always an example of this, but I think you're an incredible example of this, of sharing your faith, of loving people deeply, of being compassionate toward the lost. Uh, it really is a gift to have a purpose, and you are a woman that's very grateful for the gift to live out your purpose. Um, Yvonne, as some of you know, is an international student and just started her new job here, which is such an answered prayer. Um, but amidst all of that, we asked her to be an intern and a sector leader. Wow. And she said yes. And that just goes to show your heart because being in that role, you're really ministering to people. Yeah. And I know it takes sacrifice and it takes uh, really arranging your schedule to meet the needs. And you're such a great example in this. In this, So I really pray that you grew in your convictions tonight. Uh, we're going to break up. We only have... Uh, we should leave here by nine. So we're going to break up by D groups, by Bible talk. And please share what you want to grow in and your takeaways from tonight. So we'll break up and then um, please by nine o'clock exit the room. You can fellowship outside. I love you all.